On November 16th, 2022, NASA embarked on a groundbreaking mission, launching its most powerful rocket to send an uncrewed Orion spacecraft on a journey around the moon. It's now been a whole year since that historic moment. So where does the Artemis program stand today? This video will briefly go over Artemis 1 and some lessons learned, but also the crew selection and training for Artemis 2 and the current status of hardware for that mission. Finally, this video will also discuss the potential changes to the program, changes that could shape the future of Artemis. Artemis 1 was the opening shot of this new lunar exploration era. The mission saw the inaugural launch of NASA's massive Space Launch System rocket, which sent an uncrewed Orion spacecraft to a distant retrograde orbit around the moon. After Artemis 1 launched on November 16th, the spacecraft's ICPS performed a translunar injection burn to send Orion toward the moon. After several more trajectory burns, the vehicle settled into a distant retrograde orbit, which is a delicate balance between the gravities of both the Earth and the moon. It reached its farthest point on November 28th, a distance of some 268,500 miles. After a series of additional burns, it swung by the moon again and fell back toward Earth, re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down in the Pacific Ocean on December 11th. You can check out this overview music video I made of the mission right here. If that doesn't inspire you, I don't know what will. After Orion was recovered and brought back to Earth, engineers began the process of analyzing all the data from the vehicle and the mission. While the mission was wildly successful, the flight showed that there was still some tweaking that needed to be done before the crewed Artemis II mission. The months and days leading up to the launch reminded everybody of how finicky hydrogen is, as several leaks caused multiple headaches during the rocket's wet dress rehearsal as well as delays for the mission. Launch teams learned to implement a kinder and gentler approach to tanking. We'll see if SLS has more hydrogen woes in the near future. While the SLS performance was within 1% of predictions, the mobile launcher took on more damage than expected. The powerful shockwave at liftoff even blew out the elevator doors on the tower. During a post-splashdown news conference, NASA managers discussed several anomalies, which they called funnies, that occurred during the flight. For example, early in the mission, Orion's navigational star tracker was dazzled by the reflected light from the spacecraft's thruster plumes. This wasn't a hardware problem, though, and the team was able to adjust the software and move forward. A week into the mission, though, ground controllers unexpectedly lost contact with the spacecraft for 47 minutes. The reason was unknown, but engineers did resolve the issue with a reconfiguration on the ground side. Other issues included a current limiter, which regulates downstream power, switching off, and several instances where a similar component in the service module opened. These spontaneous commands were reversed by the ground before any problems could occur, though. Near the end of the mission, Orion's phased array antennas showed degraded behavior resulting in low performance and some communications issues, but nothing serious. NASA, of course, will address all of these in time for the Artemis II mission. Another item of note that NASA said it was still working on as of August relates to Orion's heat shield. Apparently, it took on a little more damage than expected during re-entry. NASA said more tests are being run on the ablative heat shield to determine the cause of the extra wear and tear, and that is expected to be resolved before the Artemis II mission. Additionally, engineers had to get inside the capsule to recover several pieces of avionics hardware. They were earmarked to also fly on the next Orion mission. With Artemis 1 behind us, the anticipation for Artemis 2 is soaring. This mission, set to fly four astronauts to the moon's vicinity, brings historic firsts and groundbreaking moments. NASA astronauts Reed Wiseman, Victor Glover, and Christina Cook, along with Canadian astronaut Jeremy Hansen, make up the crew. Wiseman commands the mission, with Glover as the pilot, Cook as a payload specialist, and Hansen as a mission specialist. Artemis II, a 10-day mission, will see the crew orbit Earth in Orion, conduct system verifications, and demonstrate in-space rendezvous and proximity operations with the spent ICPS. They'll then perform a translunar injection and swing by the moon and return to Earth for a Pacific Ocean splashdown. I have an in-depth video over Artemis II right here or in the description below. During the Apollo program, only 24 people ventured to the moon, 12 of whom walked on its surface. Artemis II, while not a surface mission, will see four more people added to the list of deep space travelers. Moreover, Glover will be the first person of color, Cook the first woman, and Hansen the first non-American to travel beyond low Earth orbit and into deep space. The crew's training began in the summer of 2023. The training recently included a rehearsal ride to the launch pad in the all-new Canoe Electric Vehicles as Artemis astronauts' astrovan of the 21st century. The trip to Launch Complex 39B included going up to the mobile launcher and to the area where they'll board the rocket. The mobile launcher, sans the SLS rocket, was at the pad to evaluate various upgrades for crewed flights, including a new emergency egress system with baskets on a slide wire. 
When the mobile launcher leaves the pad again, it'll go to the vehicle assembly building to wait for the start of stacking operations for the Artemis II mission. Speaking of which, what's the latest on the Artemis II hardware? The twin five-segment solid rocket boosters arrived at Kennedy Space Center in September after a cross-country trip by rail from their manufacturing facility in Utah. NASA is now preparing them for stacking, expected in early 2024. The SLS core stage at the Mashoud Assembly Facility is almost ready with four RS-25 engines attached. It's set to ship to Florida via barge by year-end or early 2024. The launch vehicle stage adapter is done and stored at Marshall Space Flight Center, heading to Kennedy Space Center next year via barge. Artemis II's ICPS, delivered in 2021, is undergoing pre-flight testing at KSC. The Orion stage adapter, in final assembly at Marshall, will fly to KSC via NASA's Super Guppy next year. The European service module is also at Kennedy for final processing. It was recently integrated with the Orion spacecraft. The Orion capsule got its heat shield in June and is in the final assembly stage. Finally, the launch abort system components are at Kennedy waiting for assembly onto the Orion stack atop the SLS rocket. As of this video, NASA is still officially targeting November 2024 to launch Artemis II, but a delay to early 2025 is not out of the question. But this wasn't the only Artemis news over the last year. We know that SpaceX's Lunar Starship was selected in 2021 to be the human landing system for at least two missions later this decade. But NASA got the funding and approval to find an additional provider. In May, the agency selected Blue Origin and its Blue Moon lander. Not a lot of details have been released, but Blue Moon is said to be about 52 feet tall. It'll launch atop the company's New Glenn rocket, which has yet to fly. Like Starship, Blue Moon will make its way to a near-rectilinear halo orbit, or NRHO, around the moon to wait for Orion, or dock with the Lunar Gateway Outpost, which is itself expected to launch by 2025. More on that later. Then a cislunar transport tug built by Lockheed Martin will go to the moon to refill the lander's propellants, which is liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. The lander itself is a single spacecraft that can go all the way to the lunar surface and back to the Orion spacecraft. As of right now, it isn't expected to see the first use with people until at least 2029. Also unveiled in 2023 was the spacesuits that will be used for the first crewed surface mission. These suits are being built by Axiom Space, and it is hoped that they'll be ready by 2026, but there's still a lot of work left to be done. The next flight after Artemis II is Artemis III. As of this video, it's expected to be a lunar landing mission that will utilize SpaceX's lunar Starship. Like Blue Moon, Starship will require on-orbit refilling, but SpaceX plans to refill the ship's liquid oxygen and liquid methane tanks in low Earth orbit before sending it to NRHO to wait for Orion and its crew. As a side note, the primary reason NASA is using this NRHO is because Orion's service module, designed for a different mission, is not capable of going to low lunar orbit and back. As such, any lander design will have to make up the difference. Like all spaceflight decisions, this was a trade-off. While the landers will need to be beefier, using NRHO allows for access to more of the moon. That's why NASA and contractors are working to build a small outpost, the aforementioned Lunar Gateway, to be stationed here as a rendezvous point for all sorts of missions. Eventually, Gateway could even be used as a staging point for future missions to Mars. Once Starship is safely in NRHO, SLS will launch Orion with four astronauts to meet up with the lander. Two will board and head for the Lunar South Pole for a week-long stay. To get home, the process reverses itself, with Orion and Starship once again docking. Here's a quick rundown of the Artemis mission plan as of the end of 2023. For years, NASA has been promoting that the next flight after Artemis II will be a crewed landing via the Artemis III mission and SpaceX's Lunar Starship. It was initially unrealistically penciled in for the end of 2024. That's of course not happening. Right now, NASA is still talking about 2025 or 2026. No earlier than 2028, Artemis IV would use an upgraded SLS-1B rocket, which has a beefier upper stage to fly an Orion spacecraft and a crew with a new module for the Lunar Gateway, which should have its basic configuration in place by this point. There will also be a landing with an upgraded Lunar Starship. Artemis V is planned for 2029 and will see another crew fly another module to the Gateway. Two crew members would fly to the surface using Blue Origin's Blue Moon. All of this could change, and likely will, depending on a number of factors. See, in order to land on the Moon, you need to have a lunar lander. And if you land on the Moon, you're going to want to get out and pick up a few rocks and maybe hit around a golf. The problem is, like all things with spaceflight, these items, SpaceX's Starship program and Axiom spacesuits, are behind schedule. But what we're holding all the contractors to is that December of 25 date. 
if we have these big slips out, we've looked at can we, can we do other missions if the possibility exists there. For SpaceX's Lunar Starship to get to the moon, the company first needs to fly the rocket successfully into orbit. Its first try, Integrated Flight Test 1, was in April of this year, and it didn't go smoothly to say the least. Now that doesn't mean all is lost or SpaceX was a bad choice. I see you in the comments. Don't waste your time writing that. The failure of IFT-1 was realistically expected. It's a behemoth of a rocket and a lot of new technologies are being tried. Could SpaceX have waited for a better launch pad design that was already in the works? Sure. But no worries, SpaceX's second integrated flight test in November went much better. While it didn't make it into its planned orbit, the company showed that it overcame many of the problems that plagued the system during the first test flight. The company hopes to fly another Starship within the next several months. Let's assume the next launch goes perfectly. SpaceX still needs to refine the heat shield for the ship portion and successfully and reliably recover the massive super heavy booster. They have to do that over and over and over again. Then on orbit refilling of liquid oxygen and liquid methane will need to be demonstrated. A fuel tanker will also need to be built and flown as well as a fuel depot. Finally, SpaceX needs to fly a prototype lunar starship to perform an uncrewed test landing on the moon. SpaceX is fast, it's part of its culture, but even so, Lunar Starship and all of its components being ready reliably in two to three years is ambitious at best. I haven't even talked about the space it's being developed by Axiom Space. There isn't a lot of new information on it since its mock-up was unveiled earlier this year, but it's safe to say that development will take longer than anticipated. It did for NASA's Space Shuttle and ISS era suits too. So what does that mean for Artemis 3? Will NASA fly Artemis 2 in early 2025 and then wait until 2027 or 2028 for Artemis 3? We'll know for sure in the first part of 2024, but it sounds like NASA is internally looking at alternative missions for Artemis 3 to fly. As mentioned earlier, part of NASA's Artemis architecture is a small space station in NRHO to act as a rendezvous point for landers and crews, as well as a place to conduct science experiments and technology demonstrations in deep space. Years ago, it was thought that the first elements of the gateway, the power and propulsion module, and the habitation and logistics outpost would not be ready to support the Artemis 3 mission by its then-planned 2024-2025 timeframe. But now it's increasingly likely that the first integrated modules of Gateway will launch by 2025 atop a Falcon Heavy rocket, potentially being in place by mid-2026 to support visiting crews. One possible new mission for Artemis 3 could be to go to the Gateway for a couple of weeks instead of landing on the moon. Just maybe this could be done in time for the United States' 250th anniversary celebrations in the summer of 2026. Moreover, if NASA orders another ICPS, or maybe two, from United Launch Alliance, which the company has left the door open for such a contract, then Artemis IV could fly the original Artemis III mission by 2027 or 2028. This new mission profile could have the added benefit of giving Boeing more time to develop the more powerful exploration upper stage for the SLS rocket, which would enable Artemis missions to carry new modules to the Gateway. Artemis V would then be another SpaceX Starship landing in 2028 or 2029, giving Blue Origin more time to develop its Blue Moon lander for Artemis VI in 2030 or 2031. But these are just my educated guesses. I have no official insight into NASA's plans. But there's more to a program than technical development. It's becoming increasingly clear that while Artemis has bipartisan support in Congress, typical budgetary squabbles over the next year or two are going to continue to slow progress. NASA knows it needs to find ways to be flexible in its Artemis mission designs. As such, it plans to have yearly architecture update meetings to do just that. In the end, the goal of Artemis is to lay the foundation for an economy in cislunar space by bringing along international partners, commercial entities, and humans from all walks of life. But more importantly, Artemis aims to teach humanity how to live off the world responsibly and sustainably while still being in our own celestial backyard. The ultimate goal remains Mars. Just like the International Space Station paved the way for a new era of international cooperation while learning how to live and build off Earth, Artemis will take those skills and add new ones to expand our species into interplanetary space. We are going back to the moon. Geopolitics, budgets, and emerging technologies are perfectly aligned to get us there, just like they were during the 1960s with Apollo. The real hurdle will be establishing the right architectures and management systems in such a way that there can be no going back in making humanity a multiplanetary species. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, at Astra.